Hi everyone. Good morning. Good morning for me. I don't know if it's morning or evening for you guys. Um, all right, here we go. We only have a couple of more weeks left. Um, there's this week and next week and then final start next week towards the end of the week. So we're covering chapter 15 and chapter 16. All right. So, uh, chapter 15, uh, what is it about? It's about ecosystems and communities. So what is an ecosystem? We'll define that. What's a community? Uh, weather, how does weather help define uh, what lives where? Um, I'm not feeling too hot, so I'll do my best uh, to do a good job here. And I apologize um, if I'm a little... <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, just like before, we have homework, so get the homework done. Um, we'll have a lab this week. Um, the lab is going to be on ecosystems and either that or predator and prey or uh, food chains, food webs. All right, so let's talk about this. So what are ecosystems? How is weather created? Energy and how does it move through the ecosystem? species interactions, and then communities. All right, so here are these flamingos. So an ecosystem, eco, remember house and system. So if you think of like the Sahara Desert, that's an ecosystem. If you think of the ocean, that's an ecosystem. If you think of a tropical rainforest, um, it has living and non-living components. So what are the things that are living in the area and how does the non-living affect it? For example, in the Sahara, dry, hot, that, those non-living components are going to affect what can live there. I remember, you know, being a young person and really not having an appreciation for the desert, just thinking, ugh, it's ugly, it's hot, who cares? But in reality, there are plants and animals that live there and that is their home. And it's really amazing because it's like, how do, they, how do they live there? How do they live in such an environment? How do they survive? All right, an ecosystem could actually be in the back of this um, beetle, right? It, it, the, the organisms that live on the back of this beetle. Or it could be here in the coral reefs. So with an ecosystem, there are two parts. There are going to be the biotic factors and the abiotic. Biotic, we're talking about the living things. So the fish, the corals, the crabs, the sea anemones, whatever. Though that's biotic. The abiotic, a means not, those are the water. Is it fresh water? Is it salt water? What's the salinity like? What's the pH like? Is it hot? Is it cold? Those are the abiotic. And like the example that I used with the desert, the abiotic affect the biotic. So, so it's an aquatic environment, yet there's salt, so it's salt water, which is going to be different. The types of animals that live in salt water is going to be different than the types of animals that live in fresh water. So within ecosystem, we always have the biotic and the abiotic. Okay, Biotic, living things, abiotic, non-living things. So ecosystem, community, biological organisms, plus the non-living components, okay. They're found not just ponds, desert, tropical rainforests, but like digestive tract. Oh my gosh, you have a total ecosystem in your digestive tract. And we talk about your bacteria and stuff can happen that can cause problems with your digestive tract. Like some, when you take antibiotics, it can actually mess up the bacteria in your digestive tract and it can cause diarrhea. I don't know if you've ever, I'm sorry, talking about this, but yes, and then that affects the good and the bad bacteria. All right, so what are biomes? They are large ecosystems. So when I said the ocean, that's a biome. The desert, that's a biome. They occur around the world. They. What are the two things that determine a biome? Temperature and rainfall. So, you know, star 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 okay temperature and rainfall affects what plants can live there which then affects what animals can live there so what's the average temperature like is it hot all year round oh my gosh hawaii hawaii's in the 80s all year round 
versus the Arctic, okay, versus the Sahara Desert. What's the rainfall like? Hawaii? It rains almost every day in Hawaii, so it's lush and tropical. Versus, again, the, the other extreme would be the desert where it hardly rains. Temperature, is it constant or is it seasonal? Like, think of where we live. Our temperature, if we have hot summers, we have cold, cold winters, right? Is the rainfall relatively constant or does it vary? So we've had a nice wet uh, winter this last winter and the winter before. And, but before that, we've had a drought. So how cons is it relatively constant? What's that like? So this, um, this picture, this shows the large biomes. This is a beautiful picture, okay? If we look at this, it's, you know, shows the, the globe, the world. And if you look at the colors, so for example, tropical forest, it's this kind of, I don't know, salmon color. And so we have tropical rainforests all around here. The yellow is desert. Look, we have deserts all around here. The savanna, those are gra kind of grasslands with trees. If we look, they're right here. Grasslands, we have a lot of grasslands in the middle of our country, grasslands here. Temperate deciduous forest, that's the green. Deciduous means that the trees lose their leaves. And if you think about that, you know, they talk about fall and how beautiful fall is in the East Coast. So over here, it's over here, yeah? So, okay. Chaparral, chaparral, ding, 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 a star highlight. That is really important. We find it in California and it's our native um, biome here in California. We have deserts and we have chaparral. Um, if this was not a COVID-19 situation, we would have uh, gone to the chaparral. We have, um, uh, a preserve on campus and we would have seen the different plants and actually I need to put some videos so you guys could see the chaparral and what the chaparral does for us. It's very important. A lot of times people think, oh, that's just, you know, weeds over there. No, it's not just weeds. That's the natural biome of this area. Coniferous forests, right? Conifer coniferous, conifers, those are pine trees. And if you look the blue, they're all up here. Tundra, really cold to think of Alaska, where the summers are, are warm. And so they have annual spring up, but then it's cold. And so up here, and then polar ice, we could see the polar ice on the poles. So this shows the terrestrial biomes. The big deal is, what is the rainfall like? What's the average temperature? Again, that's going to influence the plants that live there, which influences the animals that live there. Aquatic, we're talking about water. The big thing is, are we talking about fresh water? I'm going to move myself over here. Are we talking about fresh water or are we talking about salt water? So lakes, ponds, rivers, streams, fresh water. Uh, oceans, coral reefs, salt water. Estuaries, wetlands, that's the place where the salt water and the fresh water meet. So it's kind of, it's called brackish water. And that's actually a really important place. Usually people are like, ew, it's gross, yuck, okay. But it's very important for birds or a lot of bird sanctuaries. So if you ever go to the ocean, if you go to the beach, and there are places where you'll see bird sanctuaries, they're usually estuaries. All right, so biomes, major ecological, ecological communities of Earth characterized mostly by the vegetation present. So what are the plants? Okay, they result from differences in temperature and precipitation. Again, clue, clue, hint, hint, really important. And extent to which they vary from season to season. So weather, okay, we're gonna go through this rather quickly, okay. Um, the weather affects temperature and rainfall. So what is it about the earth? Why is it that we have, you know, deserts here, that we have tropical rainforests here, that we have polar ice here? It's all about the weather. And what is it about the earth? What is it about the wind currents? What is it about the ocean currents that actually affect this? So global air circulation create deserts and rainforests. Okay, so this is an important picture. Here is the Earth. Here's the equator. 
right at the equator, that's where there's the most direct sunlight, okay? And here's the sun, right? And you know the earth. And it says the sun shines most directly on the equator. Bam, okay? Where the solar energy is spread out over a small area and the same amount of energy hitting near the poles. Bam, bam, okay? This leads to war warmer temperatures at the equator. So it's warm and wet at the equator. And because of that, that's where we see, this is gonna be a, a test question, guaranteed. That's where we see the tropical rainforests, okay? Lots of rain, lots of warm moisture, perfect for plants to grow. Tons of different types of plants, tons of different types of animals. And that's important information because it's so important for us to maintain our tropical rainforests, to keep our tropical rainforests. Here it talks about how rain is formed, right? So air is heated as it rises, okay? When it rises, it cools. The cooling, there's condensation, and then there's precipitation. And so there are cycles, okay? And we see that on our earth. So here, there's a lot of rain. Okay, here's the equator, there's a lot of rain. Here, there isn't that much moisture. It's hot and dry, okay? The moisture stays locked in the, um, the air, not a lot of moisture that goes down to the ground. Because of that, it's hot and dry, 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south of the equator. And what we see is we see our major deserts, 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, guaranteed quiz or test question, okay? So warm air rises, where's my pointer? Warm air rises away from the Earth's surface, becomes cooler, cooler air falls towards the Earth's surface, becomes warmer, and then we have this circulation. In the meantime, as air moves down towards the Earth's surface, becomes warmer, it can hold more moisture, and there is very little rainfall. So tons of rainfall here, tropical rainforests, not much rainfall here, we have deserts. And so we see this around the world. So the weather, largely determined by the Earth's round shape, solar energy hits the equator at more direct angle than the poles, leaving warmer temperature, lower latitudes. This creates circulation patterns, heavy rain at the equator, deserts 30 degrees of latitude. Local topography, what's it like where you live? Do you have cities? Uh, do you have farms? Do you have the ocean? We have the ocean right next to us, right? The huge Pacific Ocean. That influences our weather, okay? So local topography influences weather. Here, there's something called rain shadow, okay? This is a satellite. This is kind of really cool. Look at this large body of water. We're talking about an ocean. There's a mountain range here. And if you look, it's nice and green here. And then there's deserts on this side. We here living in California, we actually experience a rain shadow. We have our mountains right there, right? We have our ocean, okay? And the air, when the air comes, there's moisture in the air. As it rises, it cools, and then there's rain, and that helps make that chaparral. But then when the air moves across, now it's dry, okay? And um, we have deserts. So for example, think of Chafee College. Um, you know, there's chaparral, it's, there's rain, yes. If we drive on the 15 and go north, once we pass our big mountains, we have desert. Okay, that's called rain shadow. It says wind blows from the ocean towards the land, rising when it hits the mountains. Rising air cools, holds less moisture, cloud formation, and rain. Rain, okay? Then the air comes this way. Air passes over the mountaintop fall, becoming warmer, increasing the moisture it can hold. So the water is in the air, it's not coming down. This reduces the rainfall, resulting in dry areas. Rain shadow. This is a picture of the Andes. But here, if we looked at the Sierra Nevadas, if we look at California, we have rain shadow also. Cities, what's warmer? 
is it warmer in the city or is it warmer in, um, you know, here, the rural areas? It's warmer in the cities. All the asphalt, the asphalt, cement, building tops absorb heat, raising the temperature. Windy. Uh, if you have big, like Chicago is known as the windy city. If you have big uh, buildings, etc., that influences the wind. Tall buildings force wind downwards. So local features of topography influence weather with higher altitude temperature drops, windward side rainfall is high, backside reduced rainfall causing rain shadow. Urban development effects. Ocean effects. The ocean currents, okay? Cold water, warm water is gonna affect who can live where. Here on our side, right, Pacific Ocean, is it cold water or warm water? It's cold, yeah? And so that affects the organisms that can live there. So um, we have big kelp forests, the type of plants and animals that live on our, in our ocean. Versus here, if you go to the Caribbean, that's warm water. And that influence, you have the coral reefs, you have tropical fish, etc. Beach communities are cooler than inland communities. We've talked about this before, right? Because the cool air from the ocean cools that area. Oh yeah, they talk about El Nino, okay? That has to do with ocean currents and warmer water, which gets more rainfall and that's El Nino. And that happens, it's cyclical. All right, now to energy and going through the system, ecosystem. You've probably all had this before. I'm gonna see what the lab is gonna be this week. I think if we're gonna do energy pyramids and look at this. How does energy flow through the system? We've already talked about this before when we talked about photosynthesis. Remember, ultimately, all the energy is coming from the sun, right? Comes down. Then you have photosynthesis happening in plants, and then the energy is going to move up through the chain, the food chain. So we see this beautiful uh, chameleon, and he's eating something, right? So energy. Our food has energy in it. And, and when we see who eats who, we're actually moving through the food web, the food chain. So here's a picture. I wish it was the other way around, like the producers on the bottom, but it's not. It's okay. Sun, ultimate source of energy, producers. The producers are the plants, the, the photosynthesizers. They're going to take the energy and make sugars. Remember, we talked about this when we talked about photosynthesis. Then primary consumers or the herbivores are going to be the guys who eat the plants and get the energy. Secondary consumers or the carnivores, they're going to eat these guys. Tertiary consumers, the top corn carnivores, are going to eat these guys. So this, is, as you look at the arrows, the arrows are getting smaller and smaller. Each level here is called a trophic level. And if, if we were able to go to the Chafee Preserve, you would see so many producers, yeah? When you go out into nature, you see a lot of plants, okay? So they are the biggest trophic level at the bottom. And then every time we move up the ladder, there are less of these guys, less of these guys, less of these guys. So imagine when you go out, you see tons of plants. You don't see tons of hawks. Why? Because it takes a lot of energy to support these guys, okay, these guys on the top. So this, the arrows are signifying we have less and less and less at each level. And also, the arrows are showing a food chain. Who is eating who? So this could be a food chain. But in reality, in an ecosystem, you have many food chains. So all of these food chains together is called a food web, okay? And we're looking at who eats who and the energy and as it flows. All right. So energy flows from producers to consumers, from producers to consumers. So energy from the sun is intercepted, converted into chemical energy as it passes through the ecosystem. So from the sun, ultimate source, to the producers, convert light energy from the food through photosynthesis. Primary consumers, herbivores, herbs, think of their plants, their, their plant eaters. 
right? Then carnivores or secondary consumers, whoever is going to eat those guys. Then tertiary, all the way at the top. If this was a pyramid, and again, I wish it was flipped, this would it would be like an upside down pyramid. This being the largest level, and then here, smaller, smaller, smaller. So it would actually go like, you know, like an upside down pyramid with the most amount of individuals at the bottom, and they're supporting all of the other levels with these guys be on the top. So for example, at Chafee College, um, again, if we went to the preserve, you would see tons of chaparral. You'd see some hummingbirds. You would see some, we actually have quail. That's kind of really cool. You'd see some uh, lizards. You would see tons of insects, right? Maybe, maybe once in a while, you'll see some hawks way at the top of the food chain. So food chain, photosynthesis, producers through the animals, food web, all of the food chains involved. Oh, how about these guys? Oh, no, Ms. Collins. Okay. So what happens when these guys die? Okay. Many times we ignore the decomposers, but the decomposers are incredibly important because what the decomposers do is they put the nutrients back into the soil so that they can be used up again and go through the ecosystem again. So here, um, they, the, the Earth's recyclers, right? Um, they're for, so they could be single-celled organisms. It could be mold. It could be bacteria. Here, the guys that eat the poop, ugh, right? They're called detrivores. But they're important because they're helping break the stuff down to get used back up into the soil. So then the plants can use them back up. And then, yes, you hear the circle of life. It truly is the circle of life. The nutrients are being recycled. Okay, so when they die, organisms from every level in the food chain provide sustenance for decomposers. Decomposers break down dead stuff. Detrivores, detrivores break down poop. An important chemical component recycled through the food chain. Yes, decomposers, detrivores break down organic waste, releasing chemical components that can then be reused by plants and other producers. So for example, in our upside down uh, energy pyramid, where would the decomposers lie? Are they here? Are they here? Are they here? Are they here? They're kind of, they're at every level. Are they the top top or are they at the bottom, right? There's a biologist who um, predicted if the decomposers didn't do their job, our world would be full with dead stuff, okay? So it's really important that those decomposers do their job. All right, so energy flows, that's an energy pyramid, in, and there's inefficiency, and um, it doesn't, it's not 100%. Energy pyramids reveal the inefficiency of food chains, 10% rule. So literally, we're, oh, from one trophic level to the next to the next, only 10% is converted into biomass, okay? Where does the rest go, right? It says, expended in cellular respiration, lost as feces. So by plant biomass, it takes a lot of biomass to grow our meat. So you can tell me, Miss Collins, I mean, especially now, right, with COVID-19. Um, if you've listened, if you're watching uh, the, the, uh, the news, they're talking about a food and our food supply and there are issues. If you eat, let me go back to this. If you eat a salad versus if you eat a cow, which one, the salad or the cow, which one's taking more energy out of the food chain? The cow, yes? The cow's taking more energy because there is conversion, there's lots of energy from this trophic level to this trophic level. So for our earth, if we're meat eaters, and I'm not saying not to be a meat eater, okay? I'm not saying not to be a meat eater, but when you eat meat, you're asking more of our earth than when you eat plants. 
and it's kind of really just from energy just from an energy level and it's really interesting because now i don't know if you're paying attention there's like um plant-based meat okay like the impossible burger um and and in reality that's asking less of our planet energy uh, wise and right now with COVID 19 our food supply our meat supply is going down right so why are big fierce animal species so rare in the world why you know maybe that will be a discussion question okay so here's the energy pyramid this is more like it producers on the bottom and if we had a pyramid like that so the most of the energy is down here and a slice gets converted to up here a slice gets converted to here a slice gets 10% is converted as biomass at the next trophic level. There's a 10% rule. Only about 10% of the biomass from each trophic level is converted into biomass in the next trophic level. The rest of the available energy is lost to the environment, a consequence of several factors, including non-predatory deaths, incomplete digestion, prey food respiration. Uh, yes. Okay. Now, in this section, they talk about the essential chemicals. I'm going to stop for a second. I'll be right back. All right. So, essential chemicals. Um, in this section, they have uh, chemicals and how they cycle. I just need you to understand the general ideas. I'm not going to ask you specifics. Just need you to understand the general ideas. Okay. So, um, each chemical is stored in a non-living, so think of water. How does water cycle through our system? Think of oxygen. How does oxygen cycle? Nitrogen. How does nitrogen cycle? So each chemical is stored in a non-living part of the environment. Organisms acquire the chemical. So think of uh, carbon. Plants pick it up, right? And then they store it as sugar. The chemical cycles through the food chain. When other animals eat the plants, the carbon's moving through the food chain. And then eventually, when the animals die, the, the decomposers are going to put the carbon back into the soil. So the, eventually, the chemicals return. So oxygen, carbon, water, nitrogen, sulfur, they move through our ecosystem. <clears throat> really weird thought. This, this can be, <clears throat> in a way, disturbing right because it's this idea of the water in your body is moving through the system the carbon in your body is moving through the system eventually it's going to come back right three most important chemical cycles carbon nitrogen and phosphorus okay. so the carbon cycle here it is again i just want you to get general idea plants use carbon remember co2 plants take in here's carbon dioxide in the in the air plants take it in put it in their sugars then that carbon is going to move through the um the uh, um food chain food webs eventually when the animals die it goes back into the soil um now and then animals okay now here, there's fossil fuels. That word fossil fuels, fossil old fuels. So when we take oil out of the ground and burn it, we're actually releasing the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere, okay? So it says plants use carbon molecules from the atmosphere of carbon dioxide, okay. Um, they build sugars. Carbon moves through the food chain, organisms extract, okay. When large numbers of organisms die, we get fossil fuels, right? Coal, oil, natural gas. Burning coal, oil, natural gas releases it back into the air. And this idea of our carbon dioxide levels are going up because of our modern way of life being dependent on fossil fuels. Why are global CO2 risings? That's why. Fossil fuels, okay? Fossil fuels. Uh, nitrogen, nitrogen cycle. So the nitrogen is in the air, okay? There are bacteria in the ground that fix the nitrogen so that plants can take up the nitrogen. The plants make proteins, okay? Then same thing, goes through the food chain, 
okay? When animals die, there are bacteria that break down the nitrogen, goes back into the air, and it cycles through. Nitrogen is a bottleneck, okay? Nitrogen is really important for plants. And fertilizers have nitrogen. Phosphorus, somewhat similar thing. Plants absorb phosphorus. The phosphate moves through the food chain um, and it's used for ATP, DNA. Um, when animals die, goes back to the soil. Again, we have bacteria in here that release it and then it can be used, so it goes back and forth. There's a word called eutrophication. That is when there's too much phosphorus, too much nitrogen. So you're like, what? What's the problem with too much? Well, imagine a farm and the farmer is using nitrogen, using fertilizer. Fertilizer has nitrogen and phosphorus, okay? When they put too much on their crops or when they put it on their crops and then they water and then uh, those nutrients go into the water, like the lakes, nearby lakes and streams, that can make a bunch of bacteria grow and bacterial blooms. And when they do that, they take the oxygen out of the water and that causes a lot of fish death, okay? That's called eutrophication. The increase in nutrients in the ecosystem, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus, often leads to rapid growth of algae bacteria. These consume much of the oxygen, leading to die-offs. This is either, it's either a boat or it's a jet ski moving through the water, and you can see all of this algae just blooming. Due to extensive runoff of fertilizer from agriculture, eutrophication now affects more than half of the lakes in Asia, Europe, North America. Not a good thing. All right, so chemicals, right, moving through. So lastly, for this chapter, um, the species interactions, okay? How do species interact with one another, okay? Um, think of, okay, let's look at what we're looking at here. What is that? That's a clownfish. What is this? A sea anemone, okay? So um, that's one species. That's another species. Now, the way I'd like you to look at it is one organism has, is going to get a benefit or it's going to be harmed or it's going to have no harm. So it's going to be a positive interaction or a negative interaction or there's no harm, okay? The other species, the sea anemone, it's either positive, negative, or no, no, not positive or negative, it's neutral. So what do you think? Does this guy get something out of the relationship? Does this guy get something out of the relationship? Yes, it's a positive, positive interaction. They both get something out of the relationship. The clownfish gets protection. Then the clownfish goes out, gets food, brings it back. It's a sloppy eater. That, that food, now the sea and enemy gets something out of the interaction. So it's a positive, positive interaction. So sometimes in nature, we get positive, positive interactions. We get positive, negative. Think of predator, prey. Predator is getting something out of it. The prey is getting eaten. So that's negative. And sometimes it's negative, negative. Think of competition. That's negative, negative, right? It can hurt both until one wins, okay? Uh, parasites, etc. So each species role in the community is defined by its niche. Its niche is like, where does it live? What does it do? How does it do it, right? Niche. The space an organism requires, type of food, timing, etc. So interact, interacting species evolve together, right? Look at this. This is a moth. Look at this is the tongue. Um, and we will say that evolutionary forces act on these species interactions. Oops. Okay. So natural selection will act. Competition. Okay. So think of competition. It's negative, negative. Okay. At the time. Um, when organisms are competing with one another, it takes resources away from both. Um, I wish, yeah, this, the, the book does not have very good examples, okay? They show bacteria, and I think the point is they're trying to show that bacteria can compete with one another, which they can. Um, but I like, in the past, there was like the hyena and the, um, 
oh gosh, what was it? It was a cheetah and a hyena. They're both competing for the food. And at the time when they're both competing, taking energy away, they can get hurt. It's a negative thing. Until the whichever organism that wins out to get the resource. Okay. Um, predators, predator and prey. It's a positive, negative. Positive for the predator, negative for the prey, right? Predation produces adaptation in both species. Um, oh, yeah, so the predators have to have some kind of uh, adaptations. They're fast, they're quiet, they have claws, they have beaks, whatever it is. The prey also have defense mechanisms, okay? So here, prey adaptations, they can have physical defense. Sometimes prey fight back, okay? They can have... I'll have some movies for you so you can see this. Um, the wolves in Yellowstone and how the prey can fight back. They can have behavioral uh, mechanisms, physical defenses. Sometimes prey species can produce toxins, right? So here, physical defenses. They can make toxins. Here, the quills on this porcupine warning coloration, they can have camouflage. These are all physical defenses that the prey can have. Yeah. Behavioral defenses, uh, they can be passive. You know, you hear about playing possum. Possum pretends they're dead just to get away. They can hide, they can escape, they can fight back. So here, um, fish, the way fish school, that kind of confuses the predator and it's a behavioral defense. This guy, this is really funny, fighting back. Some prey species fight back against their attacker, effectively avoiding predation. For example, the fulmar, a seabird, defends its nest from attack with projectile vomit aimed at the intruder. Rah. So predator adaptations for enhancing predation. Um, here, the predators also have adaptations. Look at this guy trying to lure the prey. Why don't predators become so efficient? Because... The both predators and prey are co-evolving. They're both evolving together. Parasites, ew, okay. The par it's a positive, negative interaction. Sometimes people think parasites are like predators, right? They're getting something out of it, and the host, the organism, is, is not getting something out of it. They're actually being harmed. But parasites are kind of really smart in the sense that they don't kill their host. They're just feeding off of their host. So think of fleas on a dog, right? They're getting their blood meal, okay? And then the dog is not better for it. So there are ecto, ecto, think of outside, ectoparasites, bed bugs, yuck, right? They live on their host, on the human. There are endoparasites inside. So these uh, trypanosoma, right, endoparasite, they cause sleeping sickness. Here are red blood cells. Here is this, yeah. Uh, think of worms, right, they're endoparasites. But parasites are predators that benefit from a symbiotic relationship with their host. There may be three to four times as many parasitic species as non-parasitic, just what you wanted to hear. Rabies, right? Parasites can induce inappropriate behavior in their hosts. Very interesting, actually. The rabies parasite is more effectively passed from one animal to another. It causes foaming at the mouth and then biting aggressive behavior for the parasite to move from one to another. So, for example, with COVID-19, you can think of it as a parasite, right? Um, it's, it's a virus, right? It causes us to sneeze, cough, etc. And when we do that, we're passing it along. All right, not all species interactions are negative. There's mutualism, there's commensalism, where it's positive, positive, or it's positive and neutral. So the idea of the clownfish and the sea anemone, that was mutualism. This idea of a bee and a flower, the bee's getting something out of the relationship, the flower's getting something out of the relationship. It's a plus plus, it's a win-win. In mute, and it's called mutualism. It's mutualistic. In mutualism, both species benefit from the interaction. For example, the flower is pollinated. Look at the pollen, 
right? The flower's getting the pollen. That is, and then the bee is getting the nectar, okay? The sugar water from the flower. So it's a positive, positive interaction. So we see this in nature. Commensalism, someone's getting something out of the relationship. Someone's not being harmed or benefiting, okay? In commensalism, one species benefits, this bird, the egret. The other species neither benefits nor is harmed. It's a positive, zero, neutral. For example, cattle egrets feed on the insects stirred up by the grazing buffalo, right? As the buffalo are grazing, insects are coming up. This guy's like, mm, meal, meal, okay? The buffalo's neither helped nor harmed in the interaction. So not all species interactions are combative. Sometimes it could be beneficial. Mutualism plus plus, commensalism plus neutral. So lastly, uh, the idea of communities and communities changing over time, they do, and this is really important, right? Last chapter when we talked about exponential growth curve and then stabilizing, um, I will, I'm gonna show, I'm gonna have some extra videos for this chapter because it's really cool to look at some of the concepts we're talking about in this chapter. So again, the wolves in Yellowstone, they're a keystone species and how they affect the other organisms, okay? So what happens to populations over time, right? Many communities change over time. So in the beginning, there are what are called colonizers. So, so best example for me to use, use. Think of the Hawaiian Islands, okay? What are the Hawaiian Islands a result of? They're a result of volcanic activity, okay? So the hot molten magma and, and it cools off and it creates earth, okay? So at first, there's nothing living there. But eventually, life settles, <clears throat> whether it's bacteria, whether it's fungi, then maybe mosses, etc. So in the beginning, think of that fresh plant, uh, sorry, fresh dirt from the volcano. In the beginning, fungi, bacteria, lichen, seeds are often among the earliest colonizers. They're going to live, they're going to die. When they die, they're going to bring nutrients to the soil. Then plants start to grow. Mosses trap moisture, allow seeds to germinate. Then other plants, then other plants. So the community is changing over time. Eventually, we get what's called a climax community. Longer living, larger species outcompete the initial colonizers. So when we talk about the biomes on our earth, when we talk about tropical rainforests, when we talk about the Sahara, when we talk about coral reefs, those communities have gone through succession and we have climax communities up here. So the video I'm gonna show you with the wolves in Yellowstone, in Yellowstone, there are climax communities. So all the organisms and the interactions between the organisms have kind of leveled off and we're at a certain level where it's a climax community. And if things happen to the climax community, it can really um, damage the interactions. And the wolves in Yellowstone are a great example of climax communities being altered by hurting one species, right? It says disturbance is a fundamental part of most ecosystems and can repeatedly set a community back to an earlier stage of succession. So communities can be going through succession. Succession, the change in species composition in a community over time. So the colonizers, secondary succession, yeah. Some species are more important than others, okay? They're called keystone species. So the wolves in Yellowstone, um, sorry, I'm writing myself a little note here, so I remember to put that video on. The wolves in Yellowstone, they're a keystone uh, species. They affect the grazers, which affect 
the rivers, which affect the plants. And it's really amazing what keystone uh, species do. So a keystone species such as the sea star, here's our sea star, has an unusually large influence on the presence or absence of numerous other species. So here is a community with the sea stars. Look at the, all the different variety, okay? Versus if we remove the sea stars, look at the community. What? Not a lot of diversity. Why? When sea stars were removed from an intertidal zone, which people have done, okay, species diversity decreased drastically. Only mussels remained because the sea stars keep the mussels in check, okay? So preserving just one keystone species, and, and this is going into conservation and how can we do conservation um, to help maintain the health of a community. Preserving just one keystone species has the effect of preserving many additional species at the same time. So the wolves in Yellowstone are a great example. Please watch the video. I think I'm going to have that on. I have a few things that I'd like to discuss, uh, but maybe have that on and have that as part of our discussion. All right. So um, again, uh, please do the homework. There's going to be a quiz. There's going to be a lab for this week. Uh, please hang on. We're almost there. You guys can do this. All right. Talk to you later. Bye.